Grace to you in peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This evening I want to recount the story of F.C. D. Winnikin related to our own history here on the East Coast and also apply it to our lives as Christians, especially the gospel lesson for today uh, that teaches us that good works flow from um, the life of Christ, uh, from Christ himself risen from the dead. And uh, as we see a lack of works or love in our hearts, we are to hear Jesus' words that whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit. F.C.D. Winnikin really didn't need to come to America. Um, the Winnikin family was a, highly, uh, was a highly connected family in Germany. Um, if you study the Winnikin family, um, there's pastors everywhere in the family, um, and uh, well-connected pastors as well, and also family members who were um, in the military uh, leadership and also in um, um, governmental leadership in Germany. Um, his, uh, one of his uncles was a court preacher to the Hanoverian, uh, Hanoverian dynasty as well. Um, uh, some of you might know a little bit more about that, but nonetheless, he, he's, pre he's in charge with preaching to individuals who are connected with the throne in England. So it's not as if uh, Friedrich Winnikin just graduated from the seminary, just receiving his appointment uh, needed to uh, come to America. At that point in time, however, um, if you uh, graduated from the seminary in, in Germany, you had to wait something along the lines of six or so years, six plus years, before you would receive an appointment because of um, the fact that there were um, a scarcity of calls. Um, F.C.D. Winnikin, however, had read the journals of the plight of Germans in America, and um, um, he felt a burden of conscience. It was not because of love of the Lord, it was merely because he stated that he could not lift up his eyes to heaven. He could not pray honestly if he did not go to America. So he, he went to America out of compulsion, um, not because of any sort of love for the people or love for the Lord. Um, and so we see that he made, it would require a, a, a several month boat trip on a, on a large boat over, over the seas, and he landed in a port that we find familiar here, uh, the port of Baltimore. And uh, he made his way in the city of Baltimore to a Lutheran uh, pastor there and, and ultimately would connect himself. It would be a long-standing relationship and a very important relationship um, in the city of Baltimore. Um, that pastor was, uh, was sick, and um, um, Winnikin arriving and having his papers uh, would preach there for six weeks until the pastor would get back on his feet. Years later, you'll have to read yourself how many years later, uh, he would be called back to that congregation um, and area to uh, begin forming um, uh, confessional Lutheran churches in the Baltimore area. And that's why to this day, the Baltimore area is very strong in the Lutheran Church, uh, Missouri Synod, because of the work of F.C.D. Winnikin. Now, F.C.D. Winnikin was very um, enthusiastic. He was 28 years of age when he came over, and um, he didn't have a lot of connections. I get the impression that he came over, but he didn't necessarily have a plan, but that he would go westward. Um, through the consultation with this particular pastor, he got connected with a Pennsylvania ministerium and received a call, an appoint, sacred, sacred call uh, to serve the frontier, which in so many words with the Pennsylvania ministerium meant um, point your horse west and have at it. Um, in his case, what it meant is that he took the railroad to Pittsburgh uh, the, the, railroad, the railroad ended at Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh. At that point in time, he took the canal boat 
uh, further westward, and when that ended, uh, purchased himself a horse and went west. Around the same time, um, there were two congregations in the Fort Wayne area that um, the, the two Fort Wayne congregations had just received, thanks be to God, a new pastor. I believe the name was Jesse Hoover. And uh, Jesse Hoover was the young pastor there about his same age. But after um, the great work of finally getting a pastor to the settlement of Germans in the Lutheran area and the two congregations there, uh, Jesse Hoover died within eight months of receiving that call and making it to that area. Um, F.C.D. Winnikin, by God's grace, arrives around that scene to St. Paul's. You can still go to the church there. St. Paul's in Fort, Fort Wayne and another congregation as well. And the congregation placed it upon him to, uh, to serve them. Um, he stated to them that you know, they would have to, uh, after preaching and, and serving the, the folks there, um, they wanted him to be their permanent pastor. And uh, they, uh, he said to them that, that he would have to receive, uh, they would have to write the Pennsylvania Ministerium to get their permission uh, for, for him to be released from that call so he could serve um, that congregation, those two congregations, uh, which they allowed um, with the condition that he would continue to serve the saints of God in the surrounding areas. Um, this was the frontier. Indiana was the frontier. And his call was not only to serve those two congregations, but he was a circuit rider who rode his horse and would serve um, uh, in his uh, circuit riding, would serve congregations in Ohio, Indiana, and southern Michigan. Uh, a long territory, and he'd also serve his own two, two parishes as well. Um, he felt the need um, and recognition that um, his work alone was not good enough to serve these individuals who were woefully underserved. Um, and so um, uh, he started something that ultimately became very influential. I'll, I'll mention that in a moment. Uh, you'll have to look at immigration records, but um, he writes at around this time in the United States of America because of problems in Germany. Um, there were approximately 5,000 German immigrants coming per week um, to Ellis Island. But there were no pastors coming to them. And these individuals were settling in areas where they were very far apart from each other. So um, he was very burdened in his mind and heart as he went from place to place, realizing that some of these individuals no longer cared about pastoral ministry, didn't even care that they were, that, that, that they were, uh, they were dying without baptism, without communion, and without confirmations. And so um, during this time, he, he endeavored to desire to go back to Germany, and it so happened that um, his voice was... Um, he was suffering from some sort of ailment or sickness that resulted in him not being able to preach. And so during that time, he, he, um, he was permitted a leave of absence, and he went to Germany. And with his connections, he also wrote a letter. I don't know if the letter was sent beforehand, but he would gather large halls of people in Germany, packed to the gills, and he would very emotively tell them that their German, pay, their German, their German uh, sisters and brothers were dying um, uh, as pagans. Uh, he, he had a phrase, something like, imagine German heathens. And the people were very moved by this. But what he wanted mostly was the fact of that they needed preachers. Um, I'm going to read a section of this letter maybe here in a moment. Um, because, uh, and I've printed uh, a section of this letter off if you're interested in reading the whole thing. It'd take you about 20 minutes. Um, I've printed five copies out there um, in the narthex. But um, uh, one of the things about this letter um, ultimately that happened, and this is the key, is that um, it came to the desk um, and, and he got to meet a certain person in Neuen Dettelsau, uh, Germany, named uh, Wilhelm Lea. And Wilhelm Lea never came to the United States of America, but Wilhelm Lea started um, training emergency pastors who ultimately were sent over to assist in the frontier work there. 
And um, some of you have heard about Frankenmuth, Michigan. They started this colony there in Frankenmuth, Michigan, and um, the settlements there to bring the gospel to the Indian, the Native American people, the Chippewa people, even translating the small catechism into the Chippewa language. There's another connection in our congregation. I've mentioned one already with the Pennsylvania Ministerium and uh, Dick's father serving as a pastor in the Pennsylvania Ministerium. The second one is Frankenmuth, Michigan, uh, who in our congregation has roots in Frankenmuth, Michigan, but Elsie Nectarline, her, her husband, is from the original settling families um, in, in that area um, as well. So that's, that's two connections. I think I have a third. Um, Nonetheless, we see, oh, the third one is this, F.C.D. Winnikin later becomes the second president of the United States, uh, second president of the um, Lutheran Church Missouri Synod after serving the Baltimore congregation and establishing confessional Lutheranism in that particular area of the country and having a, a large impact on uh, bringing the Lutheran churches in that area back to the pure teaching of the Word of God. When he was en enjoined, when he was enjoined to um, be the second uh, president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod after it was formed, um, the congregation released him only on one condition, that a capable man be found uh, to serve them. And I I've told this story before, so maybe um, you're bored of hearing it, but uh, ultimately um, this would be um, the person who served there was uh, Pastor Kyle's uh, great-great-grandfather, so also named Pastor Kyle. The original Pastor Kyle that came over with C.F.W. Walther, uh, one or two other pastors, and the main bishop, Martin Stephan. So that's the third connection that um, Pastor Kyle's great-great-grandfather uh, succeeded. He was a, an amazing man, succeeded... Um, uh, F.C.D. Winnikin uh, there uh, in Baltimore. Um, I want to I read uh, for you tonight a section of this letter, um, and um, I, th I think it, 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 it puts things into perspective of, of uh, F.C.D. Winnikin's uh, feelings about, um, about his call and his task in America. Um, this is just a so short section. He says to the people, Enter into the large cities. You will find thousands of people who have made their home there, either compelled by bodily necessity or deluded by the prince of darkness with the prospect of carnal liberty and outward comfort. A great many of them, sunk in the mire of baseness, already in the old country, gave rein to their animal drives without any awe for that which is holy, no longer restrained even outwardly by any discipline. Even now as I write this, horror and dismay still fill me as I remember the shamelessness with which vice strutted about not only in the darkness of night but in the broadest daylight. And how there I found the grossest indecency, as well as the most abominable dens of vice owned by Germans. Others, happy to have cast off the fetters of the church, as well as of the state, do indeed live in outward decency, yet without God, without the church, without hope, alas, without any longing for anything higher. Then turning to the frontier, Winnikin described the lot of settlers. Come now, step into the settlements and log cabins of your brethren. Behold, husband, wife, and children must work hard to fell the giant trees, to clear the underbrush, plow, sow, and plant, for their little bit of money is running out or is already gone. There must be bread. No one gives to them but the ground which they till. Small wonder then that everybody works to stay alive, that there is no difference between Sunday and weekday, especially since no church belts call them to the house of God. Bible and prayer books have often been left at home since people have unfortunately lost their taste for them because of the Enlightenment, and it's not worth the effort to stretch out your hand for the revised hymn books. No preacher comes to rouse them from their earthly thoughts and pursuits, and for a long time the voice of the sweet gospel has no longer been heard. Rhetorically but passionately he continued, and I'll finish with these last four sentences. But who gives instruction to those who have been baptized? 
How can the washing of regeneration continue its action, grow and become powerful, when preaching or instruction is missing? Who will confirm the children? Who will administer Holy Communion to them afterwards? Perhaps their parents of German extraction are themselves heathen, unbaptized. Just imagine, German heathen, help in the name of Jesus, help. So he continues on with that letter, appealing to the consciences of the German people, yes, to give money, but to encourage the pastors to, I mean, the people in the day, the pastors, like I said before, they had to wait six years for a pastorate, and yet they were unwilling to come to America to preach the gospel to their own German people. Um, I will also read a section here about how um, uh, he, he um, speaks of his conscience and how it was bound to come to America and how it was not done out of any piety. And I'll connect this then to the gospel of the day. Um, with deep regret, I must confess that as far as I know myself, neither the love for the Lord nor for the orphan brethren drove me to America nor a natural desire. Rather, I went contrary to my will and after great conflicts from a sense of duty driven in and by my conscience, as much as it saddens me that I did not have and still do not have more love for the Lord and that he had to drive me like a slave, still in times of spiritual trials and temptations, doubts and tribulations which came over my soul during my ministry, this was my comfort that I could say. I had to come to America. Thou, O Lord, knowest how gladly I would have remained at home but had I done this, I should not have been able to look up to thee and pray to thee, so I simply had to come. One or two final comments about the gospel for today. Uh, the point that I want to drive home to your souls tonight, too, is that as we hear these stories, often we see uh, the paucity of our own uh, uh, lack of action or concern for our brothers and sisters uh, who also die without the gospel. The gospel for today teaches us, however, that we have been brought into the vine of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When we find such a lack of works or love within our hearts for others, right? The gospel lesson today talks about fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Against these things there is no law. But nonetheless, when we look our, at our hearts, we find no such things. Our Lord encourages us that when we see these things, this is the very Father in heaven who is the pruner. He is the vine dresser, cutting us and reminding us and showing us of our sin and the lack of love within our hearts, but yet reminding us also and pruning us to remember that we are clean. This word in the gospel text for today, the word prune means purge or clean. It is to strip clean. That's why he says here, you are all clean. Your vine is smoothed out with the preaching of the law. You're reminded of your own sin, but in your baptism, you are brought into the woody vine of Christ. And consider the woody vine that you are in, that wood of the cross, right? Sprouted forth on the hill of Golgotha, two arms of our Lord Jesus Christ, that wonderful vine spreading out to the world, put into the stony tomb, yet bursting forth alive, alive with the life of of the forgiveness of sins spreading even throughout the world, north, south, east, and west. It is that vine through the preaching of the gospel, uh, preaching of the apostles, and the preaching of God's word that you have been brought in. Don't look at the works. Don't look at what you need to do. Look and remain, Jesus says, in the vine. That word abide means rem remain, stay, right? Remain, stay in the vine, uh, stay in me, remain in me. Leave yourself and me. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This, this text teaches us that blessed doctrine that apart from Christ, there is no claim to works righteousness. There is no claim that anything we can do anything of ourselves. It is only in Christ, in his life, in the forgiveness of sins, that we can produce the works. When we find a lack of these things, we need to turn all the more to the vine where he pours his love uh, in, in us through his gifts. He says here, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. What's the teaching of that? For God so loved the world. I have loved you. How did Jesus love you? He gave his life for you. 
uh, Jesus teaches you in these things to abide and remain in the ways in which he gives you his gifts. John 6, 56 says, Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. We abide in Christ by partaking of the Holy Sacrament. John 8, 31 says, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Consider the deep unity that you have with Christ, that you are so joined with him, that you are connected to the vine, the true vine, not the false vine. Indeed, the vine that gives you life. You are connected to Jesus, and uh, he trims you clean by his word and sacraments. You are in Christ, and he is in you, and through him you bear much fruit. As we hear these stories of F.C.D. Winnikin tonight, let us also consider how he saw himself as a sinner in need of God's grace. Coming to the United States of America and doing much work, yes, but seeing that the fruit of that or, or the, the center of that was not necessarily something pious. May we with F.C.D. Winnikin see the source of our life, not in ourselves nor in our works. When we find a lack of it, may we turn to Christ, who is our life, and see that in him we will bear much fruit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.